we're ready to go. I've got, um, I'm in the privilege of sitting here next to one of the all-time legends of the sport, Roy Emerson, 12 Grand Slam titles. How many Davis Cup titles did you win for Australia? Well, from 1959 to 67, I think we won eight out of nine. <laughs> That's not a bad. It's not a bad record. In those days, it was um, the, the challenge rounds, wasn't it? Where you yes. you were, if you won, you sat there waiting in the final, while the others had to fight off around the world. Exactly. Well, in '59, um, '59, I think we we won it back. We had to go actually in in. 60, 64, let me recollect now. Uh, uh, Australia lost the Davis Cup to Trabert and Satius. Mm. So there was one year where we won it back, I think it was 59. Uh, uh, we won it back in the, in the States. And then we. So when you when, then, you, when you had to go to do the challenge round, so mm -hmm. you, so who did you have to say play along the way? It was the Americans were waiting there in the states for you. You had to play a fight off against the rest of the world. So you, that means you had to travel wherever you. Well, after Wimbledon that particular year, we played. Uh, I think we played five Davis Cup matches in a row. In a row. So in a row. Like yes, every we played week, against. We played against Cuba. We played against. Uh, we played against Canada, and we played those in Canada, and we went to Mexico, and then we played. Uh, then we played India in Boston. Uh, Why would you play India in Boston? Well, <laughs> not in not Australia or India. No. Well, it was just decided. Uh, I think we had the choice. Yeah. Of uh, where we played it, and we played it. Uh, decided to play it on grass in, in uh, Boston. We also played Italy too, in Philadelphia. So there were five we played up, leading to the Challenge Round, and so five in a row. Well, that's, a, that's a pretty heavy schedule. Yeah. How many how many tournaments? Um, you remained amateur for a, for a long a long time. One of the I suppose I'd say that it's fair to say one of the last guys to to come across to be professional. Um, how many tournaments did you play, and, and how did you make a living? To, to, to was it was it Tennis Australia or the LTAA as it was called then? Did they fund you, and or uh, did you sort of get some money on the side to for appearance money? I mean, how did you how did you make a living when you everything was amateur? Then? Well, we 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 got enough appearance money just to survive, mm. and uh, no, we went from one tournament to another. So we left Australia, and we had to. Outlay, and we also stayed privately a lot in private homes. Mm. And then when we were in England, uh, we'd try and find an apartment, and the players would all share share the apartment. Mm. Uh, but all through America, we we stayed in private homes, and uh, that helped. Mm. You know, so no, we didn't make any money as amateurs, and uh, so. As you said, I turned pro in '68. The reason why I kept playing uh, amateur tennis for for a longer period was uh, I hoped to get win a few majors and get a better pro contact. And I got a pretty decent pro contact, uh, uh, seventy-five thousand dollars for uh, for three years, I think it was. And that started in February of 68. Well, Open Tennis came in immediately after that because Bournemouth was the first tournament, which was in sometime in May, yep. where Open Tennis was declared. So my uh, pro contract was nullified then. Oh, no. Because everyone Everybody became, became a pro. Did, but there, there was also um, different, uh, say, say, bodies of... of uh, uh, they, were, they were trying to put on a, a pro circuit, wasn't there? It was Lamar Hunt, who was a... Uh, I think it was his yeah, well, Barry. in 68, I mean, uh, Lamar Hunt uh, signed the Handsome Eight. Handsome Eight, yeah. You weren't part of the Handsome Eight? I wasn't no, handsome, was enough to <laughs> handsome enough to make that group. <laughs> and uh, then in uh, George McCall, who was living in California, that uh, formed the National Tennis League, and he signed 10 players, uh, six men, 
mm. and four women. And that was Gonzalez, Rosewall, Laver, Fred Stolly, Andres Jimeno, and myself. And the girls were uh, Billy Jean King, Francois Durr, mm -hmm. uh, Anne Hayden Jones, uh, and Rosie Cassells. Yeah. So uh, there were eight men with Lamar Hunt and six men with National Tennis League uh, and four women. Were, so out of that were quite a few top players and that sort of started off the discussion for Open Tennis to, to come in because the pros had played a match at Wimbledon uh, and uh, Herman David, who was the president of the All England Club at that particular time, uh, was for Open Tennis to come in. So uh, you were almost, that, that were almost the pros were almost uh, uh, the rebels, really. But they were invited right. to the All England Club to play a, to play a like yeah an exhibition to play a sort tournament. Of tournament. No, they played a tournament amongst themselves. Amongst themselves. Yeah, right. and that was very successful. And Herman David was. Very happy about that, and also uh, Philip Chartrier from uh, Paris was also for open tennis. Uh, the two other majors uh, weren't so keen on open tennis coming in, which was Australia and the US. But it was voted in, and uh, then all of a sudden we're all, everyone's a pro. Hmm. Well, the. Um how did the how did the amateurs go against the against the pros initially? Was it uh, was it a bit of a? I mean, you were on the borderline, of course. You're beca becoming pro, but did you find that the guys who were pro who played all over the place and all sorts of weird settings and right. indoor courts? Did you think they had because they played more? They had an advantage against against the amateurs. Well, um, when I turned pro, you know, quite a few of the players were you know past their best. Uh, they'd been on the pro tour for quite a while, and uh, uh, that was 1968. And the first pro tournament that I played in was in Hollywood, in Florida, uh, which I won. I beat Rose Wall and Sammy Gonzalez in the final. And uh, right, so you... but they, you know, they were past their best at that yeah. stage, and they still played great tennis. Uh, Rod, when he first turned pro, uh, had a tough time uh, because the group of Gonzalez, Hode, Rosewall, and all of those top players, Trabert, uh, they knew how to take advantage of someone's second serve. Mm. And for about, and Rod will also say the same thing if you spoke to him. Uh, he had a tough time because those pros knew how to mm. handle second serves. Mm. And Rod had to improve his second serve a little bit more. Mm. And once he did, then he was fine. Mm. And he improved and tightened up his game and became a better player yeah. because of it. But uh, no, the, the, the pros at that stage were uh, great players, but they were sort of on... Mm. Now Hode was also in there and uh, suffering from a bad back at that particular stage and uh, you know they were keen to knock off the new pro coming in all the mm. time. I bet. You know. <laughs> I bet. And, uh, because you are playing for a living. I mean it's... No, exactly. You know, playing for a living wasn't yeah. as if... But, uh, but when you played against them you had to get your first serve in. Mm. Mm. The, um, so when it th things did become professional, um, was there, did you notice much difference on so at a tournament? Um, was were the locker rooms better all of a sudden, or was it just almost the same thing, but except you had money now, to, to, you earned money as opposed to a trophy? Well, it was nice that you know it was open, it came open, and uh, you know have all the players. Did they look after you better, or was it anything particularly different like that? Well. Uh, you know, television got more interested, and uh, and yeah, you know, the prize money started to get bigger. You know, in the first place, the prize money uh, was very small. Mm. You know, but it was 
a little bit bigger than what the pros were playing for too, you know. So they were paying for peanuts, you know, mm. night stands all, o- all over the country. Yeah. Uh, but it was good for tennis. It was uh, a new interest in the game and not only in the men and the women. Uh, and once, once television got interested, then, you know, then the sponsorships came in and, you know, the great, it's now two and a half million to win a tournament mm-hmm. and a grand slams, yeah. you know, so big difference. So what did you get for winning your first uh, Wimbledon? Well, you, I mean, I tell people who are listening to this, but I be, I be, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're the only person to have held all four majors, to win of all four majors in singles and doubles. Mm-hmm. That's, that's right? great. That's, <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a bad, that's not a bad effort. Um, no, well, every country was uh, allocated a certain amount of money, mm. and so it was evenly, if there were 20 Australians in Wimbledon, then they divide that money up for expenses, which didn't amount to very much. And uh, you know, usually we got a, uh, a trophy that we had, to, well, a money ordered, uh, we had to go to Lily White's and a money order, Like a gift voucher. A gift voucher. <laughs> and uh, now we'd probably, be flat out getting 250 pounds for two weeks. Yeah. So it was difficult living on that in, in London. Mm. So you, rec- you uh, when you retired, I'm um, jumping all over the place here, Roy, forgive me, but you retired, you decided, you, did you have enough money put aside to sit back for a while? I know you opened some tennis, tennis academies and you wrote a, wrote a book. A book is... Well, I haven't written a book. No. You didn't write the book? No. Was it you? I thought you uh, and Rocket wrote a book. Rod, oh, we did one. Uh, we, we did one together, okay, yes. yes. Uh, tennis for the bloody fun of it. Tennis for the bloody fun of it. <laughs> I did uh, like that title. <laughs> yeah. And, no, well, uh, when I retired, uh, Rod and I joined forces and, and we did for two years uh, all around America some tennis weeks called uh, Rod Laver and Roy Emerson Tennis Weeks. And so that was pretty, pretty exhausting because it was week after week after week in different cities. And uh, I did most of them in the beginning because Rod was still playing a little bit. Yeah. He's a couple of years younger than I am. And uh, then after a while, uh, Rod said, you know, after two years, he said, if I, if I keep going at this pace, I'll be putting the lid on the coffin pretty soon. Yeah. You know, so he said, uh, well, he wasn't interested in continuing that. And then I, uh, then I started doing my own tennis weeks in Switzerland. Yeah. And I've been doing that for 43 years. 43, that's, in, so, and you're heading, that's why you're here in, in, the, in Queen's Club now. Obviously, you're, you're the champion here, but you're also heading off to, to Switzerland Switzerland, again. yes. To we've, do it again. Uh, yeah, that was the smartest move I ever did doing that because, uh, you know, our, it's a beautiful place and uh, a place where our kids would want to spend a bit of time with us. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and my wife loves it. And uh, so we've got a nice relationship and it's good fun meeting people from all around the world. And uh, nice, it's, it's a nice summer, way to spend summer. And... Yeah, well, I'm not filthy rich, but I got enough money to not be sleeping on the streets in a rolled-up newspaper. And uh, so, uh, yeah, tennis has been great, you know, for me. Well, I think myself and I think most of the players who are coming walking through this uh, tournament office here should be very grateful to you and uh, the guys for, for creating professional tennis. Uh, I certainly am. Um, look, uh, Oh, it would be wrong for me to go to to stop this interview without asking you about some of the greatest players that you've played. And I, know, I, I got a feeling you're going to say there's a lot of lot of them. Um, but if there's a few guys you can highlight, say shots that you would avoid at all costs, for instance, or guys that really you couldn't stop if they were on their day. Um, I'm sure you're one of them. That, that you'd be one of them. They would mention, but. For you, who were the, some of the guys that you found, wow, these are, this is tough? Well, I never played against Kramer and uh, a lot of great players uh, who I uh, read about. and, and uh, well, I've, I've, Pete Sampras avoided me during his career and Roger Federer 
decided to come after me, so uh, <laughs> yeah. I kind of know what they like. Yes, they managed to avoid me pretty well. Uh, well I, I grew up in, uh, uh, when I was a junior, Frank Sedgman was our number one player, and I tried to emulate him. And matter of fact, uh, after the, and he was a great player, and never got never got uh, the press that he should have because uh, he was a great ambassador for Australia and uh, Hode, probably the greatest player on his day when he, when he was he didn't like somebody. Right. <laughs> uh, good luck to that person. Uh, was he, he powerful, aggressive, quick? I mean, what? Yeah. Well, he overpowered people yeah. when he played um, Gonzalez. Gonzalez always says that Lou was the toughest one for him to play because uh, his bread and butter serve was his short wide serve to the forehand and he couldn't serve that to Lou because Lou took it so early uh, inside the court <laughs> and thumped it down the line before he could finish his follow through on his right. serve that he Go forgot on. about that one. Yeah. And But Lou was... Uh, uh, you know, he, he lost to a lot of players that he shouldn't have because he wouldn't concentrate sometimes. He wouldn't be in the game. But yeah. if he thought someone had tickets on themselves and thought they were great players, well, then he'd teach them a lesson. <laughs> and that's the only time he'd really concentrate, you know. <laughs> and Rosewall, you know, you've got to admire Ken Rosewall. I heard that he was just always tough, always on his game. You had to really stri- well, help the bidding. You know, he he didn't have the best service in the world, but he made up with it with his low volleys and his return of serve. And uh, now he was a difficult customer. He he worked every point. And uh, yeah, then you had Trabert from from America was a great player. Sacious. These are the in when I was playing in the tournaments and. Uh, you know, even uh, uh, a lot of other good players, but uh, to say who's the greatest, uh, no. very difficult. Yeah, no. because of the equipment. Sure. Yeah, well, yeah, that brings me to the next question. Really, um, the, the equipment you had, you had obviously wooden rackets or stuff. stuff I, I grew up with, just started playing tennis as well. Um, gut strings? Did you? you had, yeah, you we had gut used strings. gut. Uh, yeah. Which was, and how did you string this, the string? What? How did you get a supply of strings? Because uh, we know we're sitting here at Queens and it's a rainy day. As soon as you go out there and hit a few balls on the gut strings, it's it's over. Right. Well, we used to tie them together with tape, all those stringerlings we'd put yeah. in, and, okay. uh, to make them last. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was not easy because we had to either string them ourselves or. Yeah, you didn't have a, uh, a crew of stringers that at the at the tournament. We had to go and do all of that, you know, and we didn't have all the massages too that you could get. You'd have to organise that if you could. The only place that had built-in mas- masseuses was Wimbledon, right. and uh, so everything else you had to organise by yourself to practice and goodness knows what. But. Uh, yeah, you know, wooden rackets. It was very difficult to overpower somebody. Mm. And uh, well, with the rackets today, you know, in my opinion, the rackets have hurt the men's game because it's made it a bit too fast. Mm. Uh, and it is all power and no finesse. Uh, it's improved the women's game uh, a lot mm. and uh, made that very attractive to watch. Uh, but um, the finesse has gone out of the game, you know, because it was difficult with a wooden racket to put an overhead away. Mm. And nobody lobs today because no one comes to the net too much. But uh, when most of the players were serving, serving volleyers, um, except for some play court players who were pretty good, and you could count on your left hand the number of two-handed backhands in the game and uh, the rest were serving volleys and uh, so you know you learn to hit the shoelaces on the returns and work the ball and lob a lot uh, over five sets uh, 
That's the only way you can keep someone off the net and also tire them out. Mm. And so it's a different game. Now it's how hard you can hit from the baseline. You couldn't hit a winner from 15 feet behind the baseline and your opponent 15 feet behind the baseline on the other side with a wooden racket. No. Today you can. I mean, it's amazing how hard they're hitting the so ball. Do you think we've lost a, lost a bit of the, the, the skill of the game? Do you think... I mean, I've, I've had this argument, people sort of throw out names of who the greatest players are, and I often say, well, why don't we give them a wooden racket and see if they can hit yeah. those shots? And yeah, I, I like finesse. I like the finesse. Uh, I get a bit bored with the, mm. with the power. Is it, just, is it easy? To, is it now the big head? Do you play golf? Is it like a big headed golf rack, uh, golf club? It's yeah, like it's everybody made, can hit the ball. It's made the game easier. Yeah. The, the face of, you know, a bigger face racket, you know, it's an uh, awful lot of pace there. And you try, you try the new strings, the modern string? I mean, not that modern, it's, uh, they're 20, I suppose they're 20 years no, old now. So. No, yeah. no. I, you, should, you should try them. You'll, yeah. <laughs> you might have, you'd be surprised yet again yeah. at what sort of top spin you can, you can get from it. Because that's, oh, that's, that's another jump again. It makes it impossible yeah. to stand near the net when the guys can lob you with so much yeah. top speed. Well, I can't see how the game's ever going to change because uh, they start the kids so young uh, and the only way that they can once they start competing, uh, when they're that small, they can't come to the net too much, you know, because they they get passed too quickly, and as a result, you know, when they get 16, 17, or 18, you know, they've wasted so much time. Uh, giving you an example of uh, Lou Hode, uh, when he played, he mainly served and volleyed all the time, even when he wasn't strong enough to do it yeah. but if you don't do something early in your life you'll never learn the anticipation of where to cover and whatever at the net if you don't ever come in mm -hmm. and you've got to take a lot of defeats before before you can uh, yeah. learn how to come to the net pick the right place to go and mm -hmm. do the right volleys and it's like when Tony Roach <coughs> took over Landel to try and win Wimbledon, yeah. uh, you know, it was not natural for Landell to follow his second serve in, and probably, you know, Tony did his best with him and he did great, but, yeah. you know, when he was playing Wimbledon, I thought that uh, he may have had to stay back on second serves a little bit because uh, when someone got balls at his feet, you know, he wasn't used to it, yeah. you know, and you've got to, you know, you, You've got to practice that. Someone's got a big serve, they've got to practice serving second serves and get some balls at their feet for a change so they know how to hit low volleys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Roy, I'd love to talk to you all day, but I think Eurosport are probably about to call me up there. I'm five minutes late. So, uh, look, have a, great, have a great time here in uh, a four-time champion here. There's so many titles that you've won, and I believe one of the ones I just, somebody, I just read was you won 10 consecutive Grand Slam finals in a row you can't even remember yeah, you, won, you won 10 out of 10 didn't lose didn't lose one that's, that's a pretty good record to, yeah, to, well, to finish on you should be playing your best tennis when you get to the final <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much Roy I appreciate it